This is Curl Up with a Cat Tale, and I'm Gwen Cooper, the New York Times bestselling author of numerous cat-centric titles, including Homer's Odyssey, A Fearless Feline Tale, or How I Learned About Love and Life with a Blind Wonder Cat, Spray Anything, More True Tales of Homer and the Gang, and The Book of Possum, Head Bonks, Raspy Tongues, and 101 Reasons Why Cats Make Us So, So Happy. We're here to celebrate all things feline and to tell inspirational cat tales. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to an all-new episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tale with Gwen Cooper. I am, of course, Gwen Cooper, your host, and delighted, as always, to be here with you today. Later on in today's episode, I'm going to be answering a question from reader Cheryl Baker. And of course, as always, if you have a question or a comment or feedback or input of any kind that you would like me to respond to either directly with you or on the air on a future episode of Curl Up with a Cattail with Gwen Cooper, head on over to my website, Gwen Cooper.com. That's G-W-E-N-C-O-O-P-E-R.com. And there is a contact form that you can use. There is a comment section on the page on my website dedicated to this podcast where you can leave a comment and I will respond to you. I usually try to respond within a couple of days. Sometimes uh, the days get get past me. Time moves a little too quickly and it can take me up to four or five days to respond. But I do always respond to the comments that are left on that page. And uh, you can also just send me an email directly. My email address is gwen at gwencooper.com. Just please don't send me hate mail. I, I got my actual first piece of hate mail related to this podcast Earlier this week, I will not go into details because it it was unpleasant and I don't want to dwell too much on it. I I, I think I run a fairly inoffensive podcast here, but if you are just consumed with hatred or anger or there's just something about the sound of my voice that sets your teeth on edge, I encourage you to exercise a fine option we have here in the United States, and I'm pretty sure every place else where this podcast is listened to, and that is the option of turning me off and listening to a different podcast. It's very simple, and it should relieve any anxiety you may feel or, or be suffering as a result of listening to me. Uh, Before we get to the part of the podcast, though, where I answer that question from reader Cheryl Baker, I just wanted to give a quick update on Kelly the Blind Kitten in Sweden. And first, a tremendous thank you to all of you, certainly all of you who listened to me rant and rave about this for the last couple of weeks and actually had vaguely (laughs) supportive and understanding things to say. I know that that I got very impassioned on the subject and, and maybe a little shouty. Even at times, I, I try very hard not to have a shouty kind of a podcast. I, I'm not really into that sort of fire and brimstone kind of invective that that one hears so often on political podcasts, for example. But I definitely got very impassioned and 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 kind of shouty, so I apologize if that ruffled anybody's feathers. And and I thank you all for listening to me through it. And I sincerely thank all of you. More to the point. Uh, the the thousands of you who signed and circulated the petition on Kelly's behalf, who wrote letters to the court, those of you who had experience with blind or special needs cats, who who wrote on Kelly's behalf to the courts in Sweden, those of you who are who are veterinarians or scientists or behavioral experts or brought some other scientific expertise to bear. I know that quite a few of you communicated directly with the rescue organization that was coordinating Kelly's rescue effort. I will tell you anecdotally, and I don't really know, there's really no way for me to know um, exactly how many people emailed the court, obviously, because that went directly to the court. I do know that coming up on something like 40,000 people all in ended up signing the petition or or two, one of two petitions on Kelly's behalf. And I can tell you anecdotally that many of you obviously who wrote letters to the court in Sweden also wrote to me to let me know that you had done so. And there were nearly a thousand of you, which is just a tremendous response and and certainly much more than I had expected. And I I, I would like to think 
that a court receiving you, you know the, the a testimony is is maybe too legal and official a term, but I'm going to use it anyway. But a court receiving a, a thousand testimonials, let's say, from people who have firsthand experience living with a blind cat. And what a joy it has been not only for them, but also for the cats who they have rescued. I would like to think that that must have weighed strongly in Kelly's favor when it came time for the court to make the decision. And I am emailing all of you back, those of you who emailed me. It, of course, uh, takes a little bit of time to to send 1,000 personal emails to people who have gone to the time and effort to send you a personal email. And I I promise I'm working on it. If you've emailed me and you have not yet heard back from me, please do bear with me. You you were certainly noted and and I read you with with more emotion and, and happiness than you could possibly know. And I will be writing back to you over the course of the next week as I also catch up on other work that fell a little bit to the wayside while we were helping Kelly out. Um, many of you also have written to me wanting an update on, on Kelly's forever home, wanting to see pictures and, and video and, and just generally know how she is doing. So I will tell you that the plans where Kelly is concerned have changed a little bit. Originally, there there was a forever home waiting for Kelly in Sweden. This, of course, was before she was seized by the county and nearly euthanized. So the rescue organization is now concerned that the 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 county administrators who originally wrote this opinion that a blind kitten could never live a happy life and that Kelly should be euthanized will be keeping tabs on Kelly and might look if, if she falls ill with some other sort of, you know, routine illness that the cats have from time to time, that they might be looking for an opportunity or for the slightest pretext to seize Kelly again. That is not something that that I can speak to with any firsthand knowledge. I am not saying that I believe this to be the case. I'm not saying I don't believe this to be the case. I am simply reporting what the rescue organization has reported to me. So they are now looking for an alternative forever home for Kelly, one preferably outside of Sweden. There's been some talk of maybe looking for an American rescuer My personal feeling is that between COVID travel restrictions and Sweden is actually one of the countries on still on the the U.S. COVID restricted list uh, for for countries where it it, it is they're advising us not to travel to and where people coming from Sweden who are not U.S. citizens are are being quarantined and have to, to jump through additional hoops before they can get into the U.S., And that is also aside from the fact that I I personally think it's just a tremendously long and stressful journey for a small blind kitten who's already been through so much and should probably not be undertaken except under the direst of circumstances. So my feeling is that that probably something in Europe, perhaps somewhere in the EU, in a country that also has animal laws similar to those in the United States where it's much harder for the government to seize a, a... I hate using this expression, but a privately owned pet, which, you know, for better or for worse, in the eyes of the law, all of our pets, all of our companion animals are property. In the United States, there is a a fair amount of respect for the fact that pets are property and and respect for property in general. Again, I don't like thinking of, of my cats as my property. I really never do. But I appreciate the fact that that makes it more difficult for the government to simply come in and and seize my cats. I I, I am surprised that it's so easy to do so in Sweden, to tell you the truth. And I suspect that in most other Western industrial countries, that is not the case, that it's more similar to the United States. But anyway, if you are a listener, if you are somewhere in the EU or in Europe and, and you feel that you might be an appropriate adopter for Kelly, you can certainly email me and I will put you in touch with the rescue organization. And again, my email address is Gwen at GwenCooper.com. And before we move on to answering this week's listener question, I did uh, two things I wanted to do. The first is I would like to to welcome two new Patreon supporters, two new members of my Patreon community, Penny Nakatsu and Andrea Kenner. 
Uh, if I've in- mispronounced either of your names, please do not hesitate to email me and let me know. But thank you so much for joining our our fun and and very active Patreon community. I'm so delighted to have you with me. And those of you who listen through Patreon to my video chats every month, uh, this week are going to get to hear me read an excerpt from a new book in progress. And this will be the first time anybody has ever heard me read this book out loud. And that is just one of many fun perks that you can enjoy as a member of my Patreon community. And if you'd like to know more about that, head on over to patreon.com slash Gwen Cooper. And that's P as in Peter, a, T is in Thomas, R, E, O, N is in Nancy, dot com slash Gwen Cooper. The other thing I want to talk to you guys about a little bit, just real quick, is, of course, the the extreme heat and wildfire situation that we are dealing with here in the U.S. And I know that in Europe, you are also experiencing extreme heat and floods. We have a, a, a tornado that recently tore through Philadelphia and did quite a bit of damage there. But as we all know, the, these human disasters and catastrophes are also very much animal catastrophes. And uh, it is, of course, my feeling, my very strong feeling, that when you help animals, you help people too. And so animal rescue always has to be a, a vital and, and crucial part of of the rescue efforts that are being made for the people who are being affected by wildfires, droughts, and other extreme weather conditions. Um, Candidly, I am not as well-versed as what can be done in Europe or what organizations people would be best served in turning to if they want to help, if they want to make a donation, or if they want to become involved in even a more uh, proactive way, if if you want to distribute food or if you want to foster animals. I'm not as plugged in. And again, I encourage, I know that I have a, a fair contingency of British and German listeners to this podcast. So please do not hesitate to email me and and educate me and let me know. But a couple of things that you can do here in the US and in Canada, if you would like to be a Homer's hero and assist in the efforts to rescue animals from the wildfires, we will actually be putting together a Homer's heroes uh, rescue program for this. Uh, and, and again, but the ultimate goal of that is going to be to raise money. So you don't have to wait. You can just donate your money now. And and that would be a wonderful thing to do. Of course, when we do a Homer's Heroes fundraiser, we donate 100% of the funds. So just just so you guys know that. But again, having said that, I certainly encourage you to give now, immediately, directly to the organizations in question. And... While I generally am, as you guys know, a tremendous supporter of local grassroots mom and pop rescue organizations, I, and and who also, by the way, play a tremendous role in these kinds of of, of large scale and superhuman nearly rescue efforts, uh, it always comes down to men and women on the ground, and and small volunteer run rescue groups play an integral role in in making sure that that work gets done. Having said that, though, what I tend to feel as a person from the outside trying to figure out where to just quickly and efficiently send my money, where it will do the most immediate good, I tend to – this is the one instance where I tend to look at larger organizations like the Humane Society of the United States and the ASPCA um, because – both of those organizations are extremely adept in in setting up disaster response and relief. And so it, those are both great organizations to give money to if you are not local. If Again, if you are in an affected area and you know or work with a local rescue organization, by all means, donate to, donate to that group. And please feel free to, to email me and let me know. Um, again, this is just sort of the, – these are big groups. This is what they do. The ASPC and the Humane Society, they, they come into town. They set up relief tents and relief uh, – a relief mechanism. Basically, they do it very quickly and very efficiently. And you can definitely feel good about giving your money to either of those organizations. Also, the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, which you guys may rem- some of you may remember, I did a large Homer's Heroes fundraiser for um, in response to the California wildfires back in 2018. They are still doing tremendous rescue work of domestic animals and also of wildlife. 
And so, again, it, it, it's uh, the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. You can absolutely feel good about sending your donation dollars that way. In Canada, um, the Manitoba Animal Alliance is actually moving into wildfire affected areas and they are going to be rescuing stranded dogs and cats. So if you are in Canada and looking for a way to help, they can absolutely use your support. Also, the British Columbia SPCA, the BC SPCA, is cutting their adoption fees in half. And that is obviously in order to clear shelter space so that as rescued animals come in, animals that who are ready, physically ready to move on to forever homes have a place to go. So if you are considering, if you are even vaguely considering, even a little bit considering adding a, a new companion animal, a, a new dog or cat to your family, uh, and, and you are in the vicinity of the BC SPCA, definitely check them out. Their adoption fees have been cut in half, although you are certainly free to pay the full fee and, and consider the additional money a donation back to the organization. But they have cut those fees in half and they are looking to clear the shelters. And I would say, again, one thing you can always do if you are adjacent to an affected area, if you yourself are not directly affected and you're looking for something you can do in addition to donating money, all of these shelters uh, who are rescuing animals are are going to be looking for fosters, if not adopters. It can be a little bit of a chaotic situation in a disaster. Sometimes it's not clear if there is a person or family who belongs to a, a dog or a cat or or if that family is even in a position to to reclaim that dog or cat. But at a minimum, uh, fosters are, are a wonderful stopgap in those situations. They can clear out some space in the shelter where the medical equipment is, where animals need to be taken in and assessed and, and treated if they have health problems or have suffered burns or smoke inhalation. Once those animals are ready to move on and, and maybe at some point be returned to their, their, their original families, uh, fostering is, is just an amazing thing that you can do to be a vital part of that process. Uh, but truly, money is always the best thing you can do. And any one of these organizations is one that you should consider donating to. And hopefully we can we can make a difference here. And again, as I always say, when you help animals, you are also helping people. Every one of these animals who's being rescued has the not only has the potential to make a human family very, very happy, but may have already done so, may actually belong to a family that is frantic, that does not know where this animal is or or does not have the money to to treat their cat or dog. And so all of these organizations who are doing all of this work on the ground are making a difference not just in the lives of the animals that they rescue, but also the people who live in these affected areas. And, and one thing that I always am mindful of and that I always remind people of when I, whenever I get the argument, why should I bother helping animals when there are so many people in need, especially in disaster scenarios like this? Um, I, I always come back to the fact that after September 11th, those of you who read Homer's Odyssey know I was a displaced person at that point. Everything I owned was in an apartment building three blocks from ground zero that, as far as I knew, may not exist anymore. And even if it did, I could not get into it. I literally had to go out and buy underwear because I didn't have a pair. I did not have in my possession a pair of underwear or to change into or a toothbrush to brush my teeth with. And it took me days to finally get back to my apartment building. And the ASPCA played an integral role in assisting me in getting back to my building in order to rescue my cats. And they were an organization dedicated to helping animals, and that's what they were there to do. But I am a person, and they unquestionably helped me. So never doubt that when you help animals, you are helping people too. And, and so it really is a, 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 a double mitzvah, as we would say in Jewish. It is a, it is a, a, a righteous act to help animals just like it is to help people. And you should feel good about doing either. And with that, I'm going to take a, a brief break of about 30 seconds or so. And when I come back, I will be answering this week's reader question. So stick around, get comfortable and stay tuned for more Curl Up With a Cattail.
Thanks so much for sticking around. This week's reader question comes from reader and listener Cheryl Baker. And Cheryl is... As many people are, it wrote to me, she was very concerned about the situation in Sweden with Kelly. And and so she spoke about that a little bit and how close Kelly came to to potentially being euthanized simply for being blind. And what Kelly, you know, and, and how she had sort of thought that because of books like Homer's Odyssey and, and some of the other cats, you, like Oscar, the blind cat, and, and Juno and George, who now live a, with Oscar's family, she had been under the impression that things were getting better for blind and special needs cats. And so her question is, how can we make the world a better and safer place for special needs cats once and for all? And so the the first thing I do want to emphasize, and, and I've said this before, I don't know that everybody should necessarily look we we know in in rescue we we have to be vigilant right we always have to be vigilant we are always fighting i was going to say a battle but really a lot of battles we are fighting battles of of finance of of not having enough money of not having enough resources to do all the work that we want to do of not having enough time to be able to help all of the animals that we want to help and of course we are continually battling ignorance and indifference that comes from people who could help or who could, at a minimum, refrain from doing any harm, and yet either because they don't care or because they don't know any better or in some cases because they are actually malicious, they they do things that, that set us back or that hurt the animals or that hurt our efforts to help animals. And this is, this is an ongoing thing, so I, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture. But the flip side is that I do not think that what happened with Kelly reflects anything much more than a couple of idiots in a position of some minor local authority. And I am guessing that everybody within the sound of my voice has had their own experience at some point in their lives of dealing with some idiot who has a little tiny bit of power at, in, at some local level or, or maybe a little bit of power at the company where you work, something like that. Somebody who, who has very, very little in the way of brain power, a slightly, a little bit more power than they have brain power, you know, power in, in actual life than they have brain power, and uses this for evil instead of for good. So I, I, I have to say that, and I'm sure many of you in listening to to Shalini, who Kate was on last week's podcast, talking about the beginnings of this story and, and how things started out with how the problem started out with Kelly and her belief that this originated with a grudge that this local administrative board has against the rescue organization. And on the one hand, that, that always sounds a little paranoid when you hear somebody say something like that. But on the other hand, it seems to me that if you were a veterinarian and somebody's asked you for a professional medical opinion on the potential future of a blind kitten and you have no firsthand experience in working with a blind kitten, that the first thing as a, as a scientist that you would do would be research. I don't mean to suggest that you would go out and blind a kitten to see what would happen, but that you would look to see perhaps what your peers had done and what kind of work your peers had done on this subject, what kind of evidence and information was already out there. As when I sat down to write Homer's Odyssey and I lived with a blind cat, but I wanted to know more about blind cats generally, that was the first thing that I did was go to Google and, and I'm not even a scientist. So it does seem to me like a little bit of maybe a bad faith action that they just did no if they even if they had no experience they did no research first anyway but the point being whether or not this was actual malice or or again just a couple of idiots who really don't know any better the bottom line is i do not think that this is representative either of sweden or of what is happening in the world for special needs animals, at least not in, let's say, Western industrialized nations. I know, again, that there are many countries and places in the world where all cats and all animals are in constant jeopardy. And even here in in the United States, in Europe, in Western Europe, 
We also have plenty of our own challenges. There are still plenty of, of mistreatment and ignorance and cruelty that is out there that we deal with ourselves and neglect, obviously, in, in some places more than others, but, but just horrific neglect all across the map. Having said all of that and having discussed the problems, I do firmly believe that light, that things have improved, that the situation has improved significantly for blind and special needs cats, certainly since I first adopted Homer 25 years ago. And even in, in the last 12 years since Homer's Odyssey was published. And I don't think that that is because of Homer's Odyssey per se. I, I do not really think that I, as, as much as I uh, loved the experience of writing Homer's Odyssey, and I certainly wrote it in the hopes that it might be of help to special needs or to blind other to other blind cats out there. I think what's really kind of normalized things has been social media. I think the presence of not just high profile or, or quote unquote famous cats like Oscar the Blind Cat or like Lil Bub, who's also a special needs cat, but just people going online, share, regular people, regular cats sharing information, uh, trading stories, trading tips and anecdotes, veterinarians who have worked with special needs cats and dogs in their local practices and then publish articles either on their websites or with professional journals that then end up online. I think there there is just so much out there that it's become a little bit more normalized. And I think ultimately that's always how social progress is made. Any cause will originally start with with a handful of zealots who a lot of people think are crackpots and crazy or just plain wrong. What you are asking for is wrong. And then the but the idea, once it's out there and it sticks around for a while, eventually come becomes normalized enough that people start to take it for granted that that's the way it should be or that they want to live in a society that does this as a, for example, Women having the right to vote. It was a crackpot idea initially promoted by a handful of zealots. And then over time, the idea sort of it, it, the longer it existed, the more mainstream and normal it became until it just sort of began to feel that it was odd and wrong to live in a country where women didn't have the right to vote or where black people and members of minorities did not have the right to sit wherever they wanted to on the bus or where animals, where, where there were no animal protection laws. You know, I think that where the change comes in is when not, let's say, the, the extreme zealots or even the people like us listening to this now, we care more about animals and animal rescue, let's say, than the average person does. But the average person who maybe doesn't care a whole lot about animal rescue, by the same token, does not want to live in a country or in a society where cats, you know, kittens are routinely drowned in the river or where there are no laws protecting puppies or, or grown dogs against acts of cruelty or where there are no laws regulating or, or, or legislating against animal cruelty in general. And it's not necessarily because they care so passionately about the issue so much as it just comes to feel like something that people who live in a in a civilized society expect their civilized society to do. And I think that's how we're going to win on No Kill Rescue, for example. There, I, look, I still encounter people in, in social settings who don't even understand the concept of No Kill Rescue and who don't think that it's possible that such a thing could exist. By the same token, we have Austin, Texas as, a, as an entirely no kill city. Los Angeles is on the road to becoming that. No Kill, when I was younger, No Kill was, was sort of a fringe and extremist idea. And now no kill is is really up there, I think, with open intake shelters in terms of, of people knowing what it is. And again, I think the more that the idea is out there and the more that it becomes nor normalized and mainstream, the more we are going to see not so much the, the, the zealots or the people who, who just care very deeply. I think the more we're going to see people who don't necessarily care deeply, but no one really likes the idea of huge gas chambers where, where piles of dogs and cats are routinely euthanized. It's just not a nice idea. And once people understand that there is a viable alternative, they are going to prefer that because they would just rather live in the kind of society that saves the lives of cats and dogs rather than killing. 
cats and dogs. And this is a, a, not a slam. Open and take shelters are an important part of the rescue ecosystem and, and people who work there do tremendous and important and difficult work. But obviously, what we would all like to see eventually is a situation where no cats or dogs are euthanized simply because there are too many of them or because there's no home for them to go to. And so I, I but, but coming back to the original point, I, I think that probably a lot of people would have taken it for granted around the time that I adopted Homer, that a blind kitten would suffer from his blindness simply because they didn't know any better. And I think that that idea has probably changed significantly just through the normalization, through main, through social media, of the idea of there being special needs animals who live great lives in families, who, who live essentially like normal cats, dogs, ferrets, hamsters, geckos, whatever the case may be. I, I think that this is just an idea that's becoming normalized to a point that, again, most people, once they understand that a blind kitten doesn't suffer just because he's blind or not going to want to live in the kind of society that routinely euthanizes blind kittens or blind puppies or blind ferrets or blind hamsters just because they're blind. I So I tend to think that what happened in Sweden with Kelly is a result maybe of, of let's let's putting the best possible spin on it. it certainly, it, it, re- it reflected an, an ignorant point of view. It was the point of view of two people who had themselves never worked with a blind animal and had not consulted with anybody who had. So they were forming a hypothetical opinion based on no direct or even indirect knowledge of what it's actually like to work with or, or live with or, or treat a blind kitten. But whether or not we are ever going to come to a point as a society where most of us accept that a blind kitten doesn't have to be euthanized just because she's blind, I kind of think we're already there. And again, I think it's just really normalizing and mainstreaming the idea, which I think social media has has done a tremendous job of doing. I think that's part of the reason, to be honest, that we were able to get such a tremendous response for Kelly. I don't think we would have gotten 40,000 petition signatures. I I know for a fact that not all 40,000 of those people, probably not even the majority of that 40,000 had themselves lived with a blind cat, but everybody who signed it knew of a blind or special needs animal who had thrived, who had done well, and saw no reason why a kitten now in this day and age should be put to death simply because she was blind. So to answer your question, Cheryl, that, that is how we win. It is in part going to be the, the work of rescue organizations who save these animals, who find homes for them, and the, and the work of those who then provide home homes for these animals. But ultimately, it's, it's going to be all of us kind of sharing the goofy pictures and the videos and, and talking to people. Hey, did you, I saw this amazing thing online, or I, I read this amazing story in the newspaper, or whatever it is. But just normalizing the idea, which I I think at this point is fairly normalized. Again, that's why I personally was so astonished when I first heard what was happening with Kelly. And I think why I reacted as as swiftly and and probably uh, emotionally as I did, because I I really thought that this was more or less, at least within the, the veterinary and rescue community, a settled issue. And I'm not convinced that it isn't. I, I Again, I think this was maybe a one-off situation. We, I, I'm not encouraging anybody to be complacent. Um, but really, that this is what it, it, the question, how can you make the world a better place for, for a kid or a safer place for kittens like Kelly or like Homer was, is really just to, to, to keep the idea out there and circulating and, and mainstream and normalized and you know, speak of it uh, in your home and on your way when you lie down and when you rise up. That is uh, from a, a a Hebrew prayer, actually. But that that is how you I'm not encouraging anyone to proselytize per se, but, you know, be a part of of the ongoing effort to let people know that these are amazing animals who who can live great lives. And and I, I really do think we're there. You should not despair Please do not let one bad situation or a couple of bad apples convince you that the whole bunch 
is spoiled because I genuinely believe that it is not and that that we have made significant more progress than we know already. And on that note, I'm going to conclude this week's episode of Curl Up with a Cattail. Thanks so much for listening and for joining me. And don't forget to tune in next week. And that concludes this episode of Curl Up with a Cattail with Gwen Cooper. Don't forget to invite your feline-loving friends to listen to new episodes along with you. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, find out how to get your name and your cat's name included in my next book, or leave comments or questions for me to answer in future podcasts, head on over to GwenCooper.com now. Thanks so much for joining me, and don't forget to hug your cat today.